I'm Eric Spangenberg, and I'm the dean of the Palmerage School of Business, and I'm here to welcome you tonight. And I want to thank the students and all of our business community members for supporting us and our vision. And that includes our sponsors tonight. And we never want to leave without saying thank you to the people that helped make it possible. And that's the Allergan Corporation and Capital Group. Anyway, thank you. Thank you to those sponsors. It's events like this that help set the school apart. It's speakers like what we have tonight that help to make it a unique experience for our students and for our community supporters. And uh, I wanted to, in that regard, I wanted to say thank you to Newth. He's going to be introduced in a little bit. But I want to say thank you to Newth for taking the time to come down and be a part of our series. And thanks to Michael Wong for leading the Beale Center Speaker Series to help make this possible. And last but not least i want to say a special thank you to the beale family and you're going to hear from ken beale in a little bit but the beale family has helped make a lot of things possible but the beale center here in the mirage school is one of the key um, areas and so we're really pleased with the what they've helped to make possible in that regard Welcome, everybody. It's an exciting night for us. The uh, Board of Advisors for the Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation has been meeting very actively for the last year, year and a half, thinking about programs and activities that would help connect the student body to entrepreneurial activities and, and also the business community. So it's great to see students from all over here. And I wanted to make sure I welcomed and thanked all the Board of Advisors members. We've got a lot of them here tonight. And without their help, we wouldn't uh, have these activities. So thank you all to our Board of Advisors. <laughs> but without further ado, I'd like to introduce Michael and, and Nuth and invite them to grab their seats. Um, Michael is a very successful entrepreneur. He's the CEO of a software as a services company focused on the commercial real estate business known as Genia, and has been very active with the Board of Advisors and very active in the community, not only from a business standpoint through Young President's organization, but also philanthropically. So we're really fortunate to have his involvement and leadership in this. And Nuth, as you're gonna learn more about during this time, is a very, very a uh, successful entrepreneur that is going to be, we really appreciate you get, coming here today and sharing some of your experiences with us. So without further ado, thank you. So Ken, thank you for that. My name is Michael Wong. Um, I have an honor and a privilege of uh, facilitating this conversation with Nuth Morris. I've known Nuth for a, a number of years, uh, initially through our YPO group, uh, Young Presidents Organization. And initially, how I got to know Newth is he's just a great guy. I mean, if you spend time with Newth, very down to earth, very humble, a loving father and uh, a husband to Claudia and their three kids. And uh, he's one of, the, one of the top guys on my list of people I want to grab dinner with or drinks with. Um, and over the course of getting to know him better, uh, started hearing the story about, how, about his company, which we'll hear about in a little bit, as well as the great entrepreneurial story around how it got started. So um, I asked Nuth over a beer or two, Nuth, will you please come share that story? And he agreed, obviously, to, uh, to share that story because I think it's a story that um, for all the successful entrepreneurs in the room, you'll find um, very uh, interesting. For those of us that are still building our companies, uh, very um, inspirational, as well as for the students in the room, if, if you're thinking about an entrepreneurial path, I think this is a great story to inspire you. So um, with that, I'll just give a very quick set the stage uh, description. Nuth started um, uh, the company called Telegis in the year 2000, and it was with a college buddy and another coworker that he was working with. So as you are, are students and you're building up relationships, very well could be a partner of yours in the classroom. Um, so just keep on thinking about that. And so that was in the year 2000. Uh, 16 years later, Newth uh, and his, uh, the rest of the shareholders sold the company to Verizon, small little company, um, for an undisclosed amount. <laughs> uh, and so we don't want to breach confidentiality or anything like that, but 
Uh, there's rumors that it was about a billion dollars. So we're not going to ask Newt to confirm it or deny it, but Newt, if it was a billion dollars, blink three times, please. <laughs> so I won't do that, just kidding. So with that, um, Newt, I'll kick it off by just asking, give us a little bit about your background. Sure, thanks, Michael. Um, so I grew up in the East Coast and went to school in uh, Colorado, got an engineering degree, uh, and worked for an NGO after college for a little while in, in Guatemala, actually kind of an interesting experience that is, there's a revolution there that it ended in 1996. I got down there in 97, through, and there was peace through progress kinds of programs. And so it was kind of a cool experience. I had to go up in the hills, kind of where the indigenous people uh, lived and studied kind of the area. And as a result, I learned to speak Spanish, which helped me meet my wife later on in life. So it was a good investment of time. <laughs> um, but later I came back to the States and, um, and kind of said, hey, what am I going to do? Um, I didn't know I had some buddies that lived in Newport on the peninsula. I'd been by to see them. I was like, that's not too bad. I'll go out there and see them. And it was the dot-com days. And, uh, you know, I figured people had come to California to dig for gold for a long time and California computers and come out here. Now, my geography was bad because I ended up down here and not up in the Bay. Although, um, you know, I think at the end I prefer, uh, you know, sand over fog. And so it ended up in a good spot. But that's kind of what brought me, brought me out here to California. Got it, got it. And so um, if I try to describe the business, I'll screw it up. Sure. What is Telegis? So under the, the broadest, um, so, you know, kind of what we call is mobile resource management is kind of the broad term if you look at what the analysts track. Um, but fundamentally, if you, um, the telematics is one of the core pieces that we talk about there, and that's really about connecting vehicles to, to the infrastructure, to the internet. Uh, but then it's expanded out to really automating all the work that somebody does remotely. And so one of the ways that we talk about our business um, is that if you have SAP for your back office, you have Salesforce for your front office, and you would have Telegis for your mobile office. And so uh, what we do is really uh, automate all the workflows that a mobile worker uh, will do whether out in the field. Got it, got it. And, and so how did you come up with the idea? What was the inspiration? Um, how to start? Well, so at, say, like I say, it was the late 90s. And so myself and a couple, my other guy that I worked with were like, hey, man, we're kids with computers. We need to, be, we need to start a company. Uh, what should we do? Kind of in that order. Um, but, <laughs> uh, but we actually worked, so my, my boss, the guy I worked for at the time, was uh, kind of a PhD in electrical engineering, former Rockwell, kind of JPL kind of guy, um, back when there was aerospace. And, in Los Angeles, um, and he had gone out on his own and started a consulting business. And we designed a kind of really widgets for hire. So somebody would come off the street with an idea for an electronic widget, uh, and we would kind of go design it for them and give them the technical plans so they could go build and market the product. Uh, so in that, it was actually, in hindsight, a really good environment to start a company from, because we got to pay, um, you know, play around with a lot of really early stage technologies. Uh, so, for example, some of the stuff we did was in audio encoding and decoding. So this is before MP3 was really a standard and definitely before an iPod. Uh, we did a lot of early stage stuff with text-to-speech and voice recognition, so before Siri and those kinds of things. Uh, and then we did a lot with, with GPS and wireless data. Um, and uh, so, so people didn't have cell phones back then for the students in the room. <laughs> um, so the, uh, they were just coming down. Uh, but I know that, uh, so we had a guy that came off the street and literally said, um, hey man, I got this, you know, I was in the army, I played around GPS, and I know that if businesses could track the trucks, that'd be, uh, that'd be great. And so I was like, yeah, that, that would be great. And I uh, kind of looked around myself, you know, guys was look, well, working on some things with, um, and uh, we're like, wow, this is, this can happen now. Why isn't anybody doing this? And so we should start doing it, and we start trying to get the company up and up and going uh, inside of uh, inside the consulting company, billing hours during the day, and kind of working this at night. Uh, years later, I came to find out in hindsight, there's very good reasons why people weren't doing it. Um, <laughs> one, there used to be this thing called uh, selective availability. So GPS was uh, declassified in the first Gulf War, and that's when they started introducing uh, civilian uses of GPS. But the government had something on it called selective availability. So essentially, they would jitter the signal on it um, so it was inaccurate unless you're doing like marine applications you need to figure out more or less where you are in the Atlantic Ocean. So for like what the street level stuff, it just wasn't accurate enough. Uh, now and the wireless networks were, were not good. Now we didn't know any of that. And so uh, we just kind of started out um, working on stuff and it turns out that um, Clinton had approved the removal of, of selective availability in 98 to be removed in 2000. And we were working on this 98, 99. 
And so in that sense, uh, naivete was an asset. Uh, it was one of the things that kept the other people out of the market uh, mm. while we were working on things. Got it. So uh, I mean, just like most entrepreneurial stories, I'm sure it was smooth sailing, you had a great idea, and immediately it took off, and uh, was that not the case? No, well, so uh, I mentioned we're billing, billing hours at night. I, actually, I think my former boss, I think his business model is to hire kids like us and work them until they quit, and then take part in the company. Because um, that's eventually what we did. Uh, so um, Ralph, the co-founder, and I, uh, he's the CTO now, um, we kind of said, hey, we need to do this on our own. We're working the day and night. And so we spun the business out in December 2000. Uh, and if those of you know your history know that that was not a great time to be a kid with a business plan and technology shopping it around. Um, so we went out and tried to raise money. And at that time, there was nothing like kind of what, what, what Ken the Beal family is doing here at the Cove and some of these other forums for entrepreneurs. There was nothing like that down, down here. Um, maybe up in the Bay, there was a bit. Um, but there's nothing. But we would go out and you know knock on doors and try to raise money during the day, and um, we build product at night. And fortunately, we completely failed at raising money. Completely failed. Um, but that was at, at that hindsight. That was actually probably the best things that happened to us. Um, you know, first of all, my overhead at that time was not what it is today. Uh, my rent to live on the peninsula. Uh, my rent was four hundred bucks. My car was paid for. And I need beer and Taco Bell, and that's pretty much what I need to live on, um, <laughs> which was good. Uh, because as I mentioned, the technology, the constituent technologies to make our system work. Because if you look at it, you know, you've got connected vehicle, it's got GPS, uh, has to go up over some kind of wireless network, and then you know, somehow through servers to some of these computers somewhere. Uh, we go up to you know, city of industry and commerce and all these, Laverne and all these glorious places, uh, you know, and sell the guys. In many cases, they had their name on their shirt. Um, you know, hey, you should you should buy this stuff. Um, but you think about it. You know, Google Maps wasn't around, so there's no digital map where you could actually put a dot. Um, the warehouses didn't have internet in them. Uh, you know, the wireless networks, when they worked, and all the wireless networks, incidentally, that we started out on are all gone now. Um, so we had a couple competitors that did uh, kind of razor to razor blade model, where they one guy raised thirty million dollars to put boxes in all these vehicles. And the wireless carriers take down the networks and they got $30 million of bricks out in the marketplace. Uh, GPS took you know, 12 minutes to get a fix. So you figure about like a local fleet, you're, you start the vehicle, you're at your destination in 12 minutes. So while we were, you know, if we had raised the money early, we would have blown it, it wouldn't have worked as a business um, and we were ultimately lost control. But um, and what we did um, was that we were engineers and we could build stuff. And so we didn't have the scale to go out and hire a big sales force. Uh, what we did is kind of retrenched and said, focused on building technologies and licensing it out to other companies that were kind of playing around in the same space. Um, so some early stage, like uh, the FBI was a customer of ours. Randomly, they found a developer kit that we had on the internet, um, called us up, and she get the phone call. It's like, I'm, I'm in from the FBI. Like, uh, <laughs> the, the admins come in and like, the FBI's in the phone call. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but they had found our stuff and they used it. We got sole source and that became like a million dollar contract that funded the business for a long time. There's a lot of little um, moments like that that came through where you just kind of keep going and keep going. Um, but what that allowed us to do was maintain, we were relevant in the marketplace, constantly innovating. And then um, in 2007, eight timeframe, we're actually in the middle of a sale process. Uh, one of our, a couple of our you know, customers had said, hey, you know, these are pretty cool technologies to buy them. Uh, that's when the fuel prices spiked. And uh, we developed this um, portfolio of technologies. And in fact, at one point, there's 40 other of our competitors ran on our platform. And um, you know, we wanted to sell, myself and other founders have been at it for a long time. My boss said, you know, he was kind of really saying, guys, look, I know you think you've been doing this for a long time, but we're still like in any one. You gotta keep going. Uh, and we said, okay. And so we ran what I now know is called a dual track process. Right? Mm -hmm. At that point, an engineer worked for an NGO, right? All this stuff I learned on the fly. Um, we ran a dual track process, and, and, and the one, being, one track being sale, the second track being uh, we tested the market and going direct to the enterprise. And um, the fuel prices spiked at that point, and um, our, broadly our technology in that moment, it went from being, you know, a fleet manager would know who he wanted to fire, he just needed proof. That's why they would buy our stuff. But once fuel prices spiked, it became, you know, and at that point, you know, board members of large companies, they would have a GPS in their, in their BMW, so they got it, like the, the, everybody understood the technology. And they would tell CEOs, all right, you save 5% on fuel, I want to understand what you're going to do about it. And so we went um, and quick order, 
uh, and won a number of major fleets right in a row. And as part of that, the other thing is we, uh, we brought on um, kind of senior leadership. And in fact, I actually went out and hired my boss, which is always an interesting thing. Uh, and, and, and grew the company out from there. We went from being kind of number 12 or 15 in our marketplace to number three uh, in, a, in a period of about three years. Um, from really driven by the fact that we had you know, this kind of uh, stable of technology that we've developed over the years. So one of the things you mentioned, which um, in the backdrop of where we are right now in the economy, um, you said early on you did not raise a lot of capital. In fact, you did not do well raising capital. And I've actually seen um, and heard a lot of stories of how that can be a blessing in disguise because uh, raising too much capital too early on, you basically oftentimes give the keys up um, immediately to investors. And so you didn't have that as an outcome initially. Um, what are some other early lessons that you learned that, I mean, in some respects, you almost very being very humble. You said you kind of tripped on it, but you know, what are other lessons that you can share with the group? It's a lot, pay, it's a lot cheaper to pay a lawyer up front than on the back end. Um, <laughs> and so, the, yeah, that kind of we are uh, uh, definitely we're naive in this. And like, if you have the right pro you know, product and sales are all that matter, just one to one, right? And any kind of even balancing the books and those things were like definitely a second thought in terms of this. Um, you know, I think. I'll have to say for me, like there's, there's probably five or six other people that are intelligence that could be sitting up here telling you an interesting story that had the same amount of value. Getting the right people on board is, is, is critical. Um, I got really lucky in, in terms of the guys that I started the, the company with. We were like-minded in that we were, um, you could roll up our sleeves and work hard and you know, we'd yell at each other and throw up stuff at each other on occasion, but that kind of you know, kind of goes with it. Um, and we had complementary strengths. I think that was, that was the element. We were you know, close enough that we, in terms of strengths, that we gave understand where everybody was coming from, uh, but not overlapping. So we were able to avoid a lot of the um, rivalries and things that can emerge in some cases. And the other thing is, I don't know of any story of any founder where there's truly like any company, one guy has done it. If you look behind, underneath the scenes of any of the big companies, you know, you know, the Jobs and Wozniak thing, but even go Gates or anybody, there's always been a bunch of people there in the early days because there's some, there's some dark days. I mean, you know, we were running out of money and, um, you know, I mean, there's probably three or four times in the 2000 to 2004 time frame where we actually had mentally quit. The problem is you don't think about it. Quitting is actually work, right? You have to start canceling stuff, you have know, the lights, calling your customers. And so sometimes it's easier to just come into work and put your hand in your, heads and, your hand in your head and then the phone rings again, right? And then that's enough to keep the spark going and, and keep it going. Um, you know, and we were 16 years from the time we started to exit, but if you look at some of the, you know, we think about Facebook and some of these other things, but those are actually the rare, rare, rare exception. Uh, the vast majorities of companies that actually create value do start with less capital raised and kind of exist on a 10 to 15 year time frame. That's kind of the sweet spot to really get it done. So what happens up in the Bay and the things that we read about are not the best examples of probably what someone should be striving for. And those things happen once in a generation or maybe twice, and they're as much of a function of just the right person at the right time as, as opposed to any superhero efforts. So you, you did raise some capital, though, just to get it going. Where did that come from? So we got some angels around town. Um, you know, like I say, there wasn't a very well. Tech Coast Angels was around then. Um, Octane and some of these other things were, were newer. Uh, but they were, they were all struggling, right? I think all the guys that started that had gone back to their day jobs in 2001 and 2002. Um, so we knocked on, again, what I now know are called family offices. And so um, we got a local high net worth, worth guy and, like, the business liked us and was kind of like, hey, why don't you boys come by the office and write you a check? And, uh, and that was enough to kind of get us going, but that was on the order of $100,000, $150,000 or something. So you were bootstrapping it from the very beginning? My W-2s for the first five years combined were probably less than $100,000. First five years? Yeah. Wow. So um, how was it working with partners? Because oftentimes you'll have an entrepreneur idea and you do it by yourself. You actually had a couple people there with you. Was that a good thing or a bad thing? Without a doubt, it was a good thing. I mean, it's, it's like, it's a marriage in many respects. I mean, there's probably, there's probably a span of years I went by and I was talking to some of them. Uh, but as long as your motivations are in the, in the right spot, um, you, you know, you'll be, you'll be good. Like I say, it, I mean, it's, it's hard. I mean, maybe, you know, I don't know what it was like to be super flush with cash. I, I assume that it would be hard, but just in a different way. Um, but the partners, the partners are important, I think. Um, like I said, I don't, maybe you can pull something off in one dimension as by yourself, uh, but really all, it takes a lot of different dimensions to get a business going. So, you know, I'm in the process of building a business right now, and it's my baby, and I, I'm seeing it grow. Um, you mentioned something that's interesting to me. 
when you brought in somebody else to be your boss? I mean, that must have been emotionally difficult. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was, you know, and I was still on the board and some other things, you know, it was kind of like just kind of this, but there's an element of just running the business where, you know, kind of books, HR, all these other different things, where it was good to have, um, you know, somebody who'd done that before on board. So. Yeah, yeah. So um, you and I have spoken about it, about a dozen years of kind of bumping around, trying to bootstrap it, raising a little bit of capital here and there. What was the catalyst that really kind of took it to the next level? It really it was, um, we were in the right place to do it because we had, we were growing actually, it was interesting, we started growing, we were already turning like this, and we had, you know, you get these different stages of people can buy, right? You get these different bands, and you kind of get no man's lands, I, I, I kind of understanding this. Um, and so there's a number of our customers who are really, at that point, there are ISVs, the FBI is kind of an exception. A lot of these other companies were software companies that are in the 20 to $50 million revenue range. So you're um, selling to uh, a distribution channel that resells you out. Right. Got it. So many, a lot of those guys wanted to buy us, but at the same time, we started landing these big deals. And so we were growing faster than what the acquirers could, could appreciate. And, we, and we, this happened a couple different times where we grew out of the natural acquirers and you end up with a different band where you have to kind of be, you know, like a, a, you know, kind of a, a factor or higher before you get to the next realm of where you're big enough that it's interesting the next guys, you know. Um, and then you're proving out the marketplace. Mm -hmm. so. and, then, and then what was that institutional round like? What was the decision like to go raise that round? What was it, and, and how much did you raise? Yeah, so the first round that we took, so uh, we took our first round of financing in 2013. It was led by Kleiner Perkins. Uh, it was $93 million. And so that was the first time we took taken, you know, to date, the non-capital invest in the company uh, had been about you know, $250,000 in equity capital and then $5 million in debt to do some acquisitions. So $93 million on top of that was a significant round. I think it was the largest in Orange. It might have been largest in California. What were you, what, I mean, $93 million? Did, do you know what you were going to do with it? <laughs> well, yes and no. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, what was happening at that time, why we raised the money is, you know, if, if you think about installing things in vehicles, you know, there's, we all kind of knew that, in the future, we weren't going to be hunting these vehicles down in the wild to rip out the dash to get them connected, right? Uh, and so what that was meant to do was to really uh, fund the transition and really work with the, the OEMs, the auto manufacturers. And if you dealt with auto manufacturers or whatever else, they don't move fast. They're moving faster now, but they don't move fast. And you know, there's just a lot of things that are different in terms of the business model. So that's what that, that round of, of financing did. Uh, and then brought in, you know, Something that we were, you know, brought in the guys from, from KP, they're on our board, and you know, I thought they were, they were, they were smart money. And I, I really appreciated some of the early stage money with just Angel where somebody's writing a check versus what a Kleiner Perkins brings to the table. And it's significant. Now, it comes with razor sharp eyes who ask hard questions. Um, so you have to be prepared for that. Um, but if you're good for that, good with that, then um, you know, the relationships they brought, they subsequently got GM and Ford to invest in us, and that was really driven by the KP guys. Um, at, you know, the KI Kuwaiti Investment Authority and some other things that just not would not have come to us came to us because of Kleiner Perkins. Got it, got it. But that being said, uh, we were $85 million, had been profitable when we did it, and 70% of our revenue was recurring at 90% gross margin. Hmm. So we're in a good position to negotiate with those guys. Um, if you're burning cash and if you're early stage, you're not in as good a position. Mm -hmm, so. Mm -hmm. So the capital gets raised 2013, you have all this money, you start building a team, um, and then you're having some momentum with executing on the business model. Why sell? Yeah, so it was, um, you know, it was not a, even at the board level, I'll say that it wasn't necessarily, I mean, it was, it, there was a lot of dissenting voices because it's, you know, it's early days, um, still in the connected car space. Probably only if you are in this room, probably if you only bought a car in the last two or three years, is it connected, right? On the average car life cycle is seven years, so there's a lot of market, and, it, it, and it's only connected right now if it's a GM or if it's like a high-end car. So there's still a lot of way to go on this. Um, so when we looked at it, there were some macro forces that look, they looked at this. The IPO market until very recently, as in this, this month, was closed and had been closed for like really two years. Um, there had been like a lot of the Snapchat and unicorn type things are coming a lot of scrutiny, so valuations were compressing. Um, which, that's the thing is, if you, know, if you watch Silicon Valley, I mean, for me it's almost hard to watch it. My wife will attest because I'm just hitting my hands like, yeah, we've done all that kind of stuff that this guy did. 
Uh, but if you push out the valuation too hard, too high, which everybody wants to have the big valuation, and you need to go to second round, and if the, even things are outside of your control change, you're gonna be in a bad spot coming in to gain the next set of money. We, we weren't in that spot, but there was definitely those kinds of pressures were coming down on us. Um, you know, oil prices were not what they were, so the, like I said, the Kuwaitis weren't our deal, that stuff was all gone. Mm. So the financing options were, were getting narrow. Um, but more than that, when we looked at the space, um, you know, kind of back of our minds, so we get, call it $100 per vehicle per month, you include the vehicle and the worker. There's 20 million fleet vehicles in the US, that's a $24 billion market in the US. There's 30 million fleet vehicles in Europe, 17 million in Latin America, who knows how many in China and India. Um, so when you start doing those numbers, the market gets big. Uh, and there's always a question, once it starts getting the right spot, big guys are gonna get in. And I think mm -hmm. when we looked at what it was gonna take to compete, and we knew that you know, $93 million is nice, um, but the next level of guys getting in, that would be, you know, they're, they're, they've written a business plan for that amount, right? Mm -hmm. So what they're gonna put after that is gonna be at the next level. Uh, and in fact, that's what you know, happened. So um, you know, we came to market at the right time, um, we ran a, a pretty good process. Um, can't disclose much about that process, but I can say that AT&T was our largest customer, we're their largest partner. Um, Verizon bought us. Uh, and as it showed, Verizon, you know, spent, you know, the, uh, we were not disclosed, but they bought us the next largest, our largest competitor for 2.4 billion. Uh, they're not done. And there's a lot of companies that are, that are around this that are ready to come in. And so, um, yeah, that was kind of the next, there's some certain elements in our business that didn't lend themselves to viral growth, like what you see on the consumer side. Uh, it's gonna be capital intensive relative to a software business. So you gotta be willing to spend uh, the way that the next generation of guys are. Got it. So we have a lot of students in the audience. Um, anybody out there with an entrepreneurial uh, gut instinct of them wanting to do something, you know, start up a business, what kind of advice can you give them? So, well, I, you know, we've got some, uh, some uh, Mirage MBAs that are up right here. And actually, if they come across my door and they're from here, I presume that they want to start their own business, right? This is just a path along the way. So uh, it's like, how long can we keep them interested before they move on? Um, this, like, you know, the it, technology's interesting. Like, I think about, you know, in this moment, maybe I will be at the future, I look at, you know, what I'll do next. You know, I'm, I'm far from technology now, in terms of where, I mean, we're, we are a technological company. There's people in our company that are very close to it, but, you know, I operate in Excel and PowerPoint. We're a little bit more progressive than that. So Google Sheets and Google Slides, right? But still, <laughs> that's, that's, that's where I operate compared to, like, with the oscilloscope and, and programming and stuff like that. Uh, so I think, you know, that's some, something to be conscious of, particularly as you get more business-minded, is you need, you know, have good, strong technical talent. I think the technical undergrad, I think that's what this school does well, is provide people with technical undergrads that have the business sense. That gives you a, you know, even if you're not as close to that, it'll never go away, because it gives you a great bullshit detector. Right, you might able to bill it, but you can, sm you can smell it if it's wrong. Um, but having a good technical partner there is always, that's just indispensable, right? And understand the talent, wherever it comes from. Um, you know, I think, uh, and then the ideas can, you know, come from anywhere, I would say. You know, I, I think the vehicle, connected vehicles was definitely a good thing. That I, I think the idea that I kicked myself for is that uh, the school, I went to Colorado School of Mines, which I don't know if you guys know it, it's, a, it's big in chemical refining and some other things. And uh, 92, I was a freshman, I walked in, and there was this a graduate student, he looks at me, and he's like, hey man, I want to try my beer. I was like, what do you mean try your beer? He's like, I have a brew beer in my basement. And I was like, what, that's legal? You know, I went down there, and so that was actually the first thing I actually saw, was, I was like, there could be breweries everywhere, right? But it seemed way too cool that you're gonna make money doing that, right? So, uh, and the sculpting guy started the same year we did, and sold for you know, about the same thing as we did in the same time frame. So, uh, I've had a great time doing this, but I maybe missed out on a better time. But the point being, <laughs> so the point being is that like there's not the technology stuff is where we get fixated, but there are ideas that are around that, and that a lot most everything is enabled and accelerated by technology now. Um, and so, and a lot of the compelling things, there's core technology, and then there's also what you know what businesses can can you disrupt and what business models can you change with technology on top of it? So it's multi multifaceted, particularly now, I think as opposed to where you know, kind of some of the early days, and even where we play, we're kind of an infrastructure play, which is fairly straightforward. It's monetized on one dimension. We make a product, we sell it to the end user. Um, now a lot of the opportunities are not, you know, kind of not with that kind of a straightforward business model. So I think it's, it's to look around in 360 and make sure you don't get blinded on, on some of these things. So I'll ask you one last question. What now? 
Uh, well, so I'm uh, concerned to work with Verizon. I say they, um, these guys, I've been very impressed in working with them. And um, in a lot of, you know, I get asked this question a lot, but we've had a number of different phases throughout the history of the company, and uh, this is just a new, a new chapter in the book. Um, we are, can't talk exactly about it, we are a very, very formidable player in our industry now. They don't break out this section yet. Um, and I would say that um, barring mix, mis-execution on our side, we're on a good trajectory to be like that forever. And so that's, that's a very um, exciting place to be in. And if you think about connecting everything that moves to the internet, it's a big, it's a big thing. It's a lot mm -hmm. of work that has left to be done. Oh, that's exciting. Well, I think that's about all the time we have. Great story. It's a great way to tell it as well, and I'd, I'd like to hear more about it. I think this opportunity, we have a little bit of an opportunity out here. We've got a reception out here, and I invite you all to stick around and visit, maybe get a chance to meet our uh, speakers tonight, meet Newth, meet Michael. I think w one of the things I'd just say is, is it's just really great to, to see that this is a place where you can not only start businesses, but you can grow businesses, and we don't you don't have to go to somewhere up north, right? I mean, you talk about it, we think about it, but uh, why would you go there when you could be here, right? <laughs> yeah, you can clap, I agree, yeah. <laughs> and so uh, the Palmerage School of Business is making every effort to become the kind of place where we can have discussions like this, we can host speakers like this, and we can motivate people to, to do the kinds of things that Newth has done. And, uh, there were probably a lot of days you didn't think you were going to make it, right? Absolutely. Right. But you just got to keep, stick with it. And that's what you got to do when you're a student. That's what you got to do when you're a faculty member or an administrator. You just got to stick with it, right? So I invite you to come out there, like I say. But we're going to take a couple pictures here, and we'll all be out there in a little bit. So thanks very much for coming tonight. Okay.